Welcome to our webinar on Hunter syndrome. My name is Florian Lagler and I am pediatrician and pharmacologist working in Salzburg, Austria and I am taking care for patients with Hunter syndrome and other lysosomal storage diseases. This is my disclosure. Today it's my pleasure to present one of my cases to you in order to discuss the specific disease complications and how they give us an option to make the diagnose early. But first of all, let me ask you, what is your professional focus? Please make your vote. Are you involved in the diagnostics and or clinical management of MPS? Mainly management of patients, mainly involved in laboratory diagnostics, or are you equally involved in both or none of the above? So we have a result. Everybody of you seems to be not involved yet in the management of MPS patients. And the second question is, do you manage pediatric or adult patients? So th this question then refers to your other patients, not the hunters patients. Do you mainly take care for pediatric patients or for adult patients or pediatric and adult as well? Or do you not at all see patients? Please make your vote. And we have a result. So all of you are seeing pediatric and adult patients. So what is Hunter's syndrome? You may know that Hunter's syndrome or mucopolysaccharidosis type 2 is a genetic condition that leads to progressive and irreversible buildup of GAGs, glycosaminoglycans in different tissues and organs. <clears throat> it's a multi-organ disease and unfortunately late diagnosis is rather the rule than the exception. So let's focus on the clinical case. Tom was born after 42 weeks of gest gestation and he is the first son of non-consanguineous parents. He had a hydrocele testis in, uh, at birth and uh, was screened and hearing was fine. In two months of age, uh, facial nerve palsy was detected by an asymmetric crying face. And the ultrasonography of the brain showed uh, enlarged lateral and third cerebral ventricle. At three months, he developed macrocephaly. At that time, he was on the 74th percentile and uh, at five months, he had an obstructive hydrocephalus demonstrated in the MRI investigation. So he received a ventricular peritoneal shunt. In the second year of life, first of all, his processus vaginalis was closed uh, operatively. And at 19 months, he presented with an umbilical hernia and with hepatosplenomegaly. He had mild psychomotor retardation. He presented with aggressiveness and um, he had ENT symptoms like uh, that he needed an aden uh, adenoidectomy and a tonsillectomy. He had a combined hearing loss, so he needed hearing aids. And she, he presented, as you can see at the pictures, with a spinal stiffness. So finally, he was diagnosed at 19 months with a Hunter's syndrome. Please have a look at the pictures. So the question is, do you think that Tom, that his case was a very unusual case of Hunter's syndrome? Do you think it's a classical severe case of Hunter's syndrome? Or do you think it's, well, it's the classical symptoms, however, they didn't present very severe. Please make your choice. And we have a result. You agree on that this is a classical severe case of MPS2. So, well, I agree with you. And this is a figure uh, that you might have seen earlier. It's data that comes from the Hunter's 
uh, observational survey and it shows all typical features. Cardiac valve disease is prevalent in 57% of all patients and it occurs in median at five to six years and this is the range. So it, you can see that um, kyphosis, scoliosis, joint stiffness, enlarged tongue, enlarged tonsils and adenoids, enlarged liver and spleen, face, facial features, nasal obstruction, hernia and otitis. All these are marked in blue and all these were prevalent um, in Tom right in the second year of life. So you can see that most of the most common complications of Hunter's disease have been prevalent in Tom in the second year of life. So even earlier than uh, in median as compared to other patients in the Hunter's survey. So this can absolutely be referred to as a classical case because cardiac valve uh, involvement was not present, but normally this takes place much later. So he presents with all the classical features of Hunter's disease. Many Hunter's patients need a lot of operations and this is also true for our patient, for Tom. He already had a tympanostomy, he had a hernia repair, a denectomy, tonsillectomy and this is also the case in roughly one-third to half of the other patients. More than 80% need any procedure and there is a lot of other procedures that have to be done in these patients. So as a matter of fact, Tom saw a lot of different specialists, a lot of dif different physicians before he was diagnosed. Um, as a matter of fact, this was pediatrician, so the family doctor, the pediatricians at the hospital, pediatric surgeons at the hospital, neurosurgeon at the hospital, ENT in practice and ENT surgeons and the orthopedist, orthopedist. All these specialists have seen Tom before he was diagnosed. So the question is, would any one of these have had a chance to make the diagnosis earlier? And as a matter of fact, it's most of the uh, cases have a surgical procedure before they are, they are diagnosed. Now, if you have a look at the prevalence of Hunter's syndrome, which is roughly one in 136,000 uh, uh, patients, or if you refer to MPS patients as a group, that's one in um, roughly uh, 23,000. That's rare diseases, of course, and uh, the um, features that they present with are not so common as well, but much more common as Hunter's disease. Hydrocephalus is seen in one in 1,000 patients overall. Kyphosis scoliosis, about the same. Congenital hydrocele is more common and also umbilical hernia. So the question is, if we observe such combinations of clinical, clinical features, when should we or when should a pediatrician suspect that Hunter's disease is prevalent? Now, please make one choice. Obviously, there is not one single best choice, but we want to learn about your priorities which combination should lead a pediatrician to sp suspect Hunter's disease? A hydrocele plus hydrocephalus, inguinal hernia and umbilical hernia, hydrocephalus plus kyphosis and scoliosis, kyphosis, scoliosis and enlarged adeno adenoids and tonsils, or do you think that only a combination of three or more of any of the symptoms above mentioned are indicative? Okay, we have a result. So, some of you, uh, about 60% uh, 
think that only three symptoms or more are indicative and 40% think that kyphosis and scoliosis plus enlarged adenoids and tonsils should be indicative uh, to go for further investigations if Hunter syndrome is prevalent. Well, I think that any of these combinations could be a sign and in some patients that do not present with a very severe phenotype, we only observe, first of all, a combination of two symptoms or complications and therefore we should be um, very alarmed if we, um, if we observe something that could be one of these combinations. And then it's obvious that uh, metabolic pediatricians or geneticists, they are well trained in observing such complications and recognizing such patterns to do the right diagnosis. But there is many uh, professional groups and uh, specialists that are not as well uh, trained in these rare diseases because it's not their main topic. So the question is, if you could train only one group of specialists in the identification of patients like Tom, which group would you select? Would you train orthopedics or would you train physical therapists? They see obviously a lot of those patients given the spinal stiffness and the other problems that they can have with the joints. Pediatric surgeons that may take care for the hernias neurosurgeons that are involved in the hydrocephalus or ENT specialists who sometimes not so rarely are the specialists that see these patients first for clinic for opera uh, operational uh, interventions. Okay, I think we have a result here. So I, you decided for pediatric surgeons at the hospital, that's uh, more than half of you that uh, want to train pediatric surgeons. And as a matter of fact, we uh, performed a case finding study in pediatric surgeons. Whenever uh, a patient had two or more hernias, uh, different hernias, the pediatric surgeons were invited to do a screening test for Hunter's disease and other MPS uh, diseases and we learned that um, it's not so easy to uh, convince pediatric surgeons uh, about the relevance of this disease because uh, it's understood it's, that it's too rare. But I agree with you that this is a very important target group and um, I have made the personal experience that as soon as one of the pediatric surgeons sees a true hunter patient, they are very motivated and keen in finding these patients very early. Orthopedics are as well a target group, of course, and also um, neurosurgeons and ENT specialists. So, I want to conclude uh, the presentation with making you aware of the very common symptoms of Hunter's disease. They can lead you to the right diagnosis and uh, given the risks that these patients have, particularly if they have to underwent, undergo uh, operational procedures, it's important to make the diagnosis very early and to make them uh, to provide the causal therapy, enzyme replacement therapy to those patients. The early signs, the complications of the disease, they can be a very good red flag symptom or a hint to make the right diagnosis. And if you are not sure if it might be uh, mucopolysaccharidosis, then you should go for a screening test that's very easily done in dried blood and uh, can be done fast and straightforward. So I hope you got a good impression on the importance of recognizing these clinical um, features and clinical patterns that lead you to an early diagnosis of MPS. And 
these are links where you can find further information on Hunter's disease and other mucopolysaccharidosis. And with that, I want to close the presentation and I'm happy to receive your questions. So the question is, how can physicians increase their chance of evaluating Hunter syndrome correctly when a patient comes to them with symptoms? So, of course, what is very helpful is um, if you have the first contact with a true Hunter's patient and you see the clinical features and um, this helps you to remember the features. But not everybody is in uh, the situation to meet a hunter's uh, patient or to diagnose one before they see the first. So I recommend to make contact with uh, patient organizations and maybe participate in a patient group meeting where you can see a lot of uh, patients. This makes it much easier to separate the clinical features, particularly the facial features, from other diseases and also other genetic diseases. If you are uh, not sure that the patient that somehow looks um, um, suspicious to you might have a Hunter syndrome, then you should contact some, an expert, uh, maybe send the pictures or get, make contact with an expert uh, to evaluate these patients. The screening tests for Hunter syndrome are very straightforward, so you only need a few drops of blood and you can do uh, genetics as well as enzyme um, activity to make the right diagnosis. And I see we have another question here. Are there any common overlapping conditions that occur in Hunter syndrome patients that could obscure the symptoms or complications of Hunter syndrome? Well, of course, there are other genetic diseases or diseases in general that could obscure the, the symptoms. And I had many discussions with specialists from the field of ENT, for example, or, or pediatric surgeons, when they would consider a patient uh, to, um, who needs further diagnostics. So, the features that they present with, like the ENT problems, for example, or the hernia, of course they are not very specific, but you should be trained in recognizing the patterns, the combinations of the different uh, symptoms, and uh, then it's much easier. And another way of approaching this problem is whenever you have, for example, as an ENT, a case that has um, many episodes of otitis and increasing hearing loss and so on and the regular workup, the regular management of these patients including a surgical procedure simply would not help in a way you would expect it. Then go for further uh, evidence and don't accept it to be a, a normal case. It might be a genetic disease, particular mucopolysaccharidosis. So two things make you aware of the clinical patterns of the disease and as well if you have a severe case of ENT with ENT problems as uh, pointed out in Tom's case or if you have uh, multiple hernias then don't accept it as given and uh, go and look for the cause. Uh, also centers for rare diseases can give good advice in that so whenever you observe some, something obscure then they might be helpful in finding the right diagnosis. And I think we have another question here. To what extent can earlier diagnosis benefit patient outcome? And what time scale do benefits appear, weeks, months or years? So, Obviously, um, the early diagnosis of Hunter's disease or other mucopolysaccharidosis has many advantages. First of all, you can offer um, the enzyme replacement therapy for treating those patients. And given the fact that uh, gag storage already occurs in the unborn babies, it's very important to start the uh, treatment early to prevent um, irreversible damage of uh, tissue and organs. So the prognosis uh, and the success of treatment is very much dependent on early diagnosis. 
Uh, there is not so many cases, but there is a number of cases uh, with um, siblings that have been diagnosed at birth after a sibling was diagnosed later. And there you can uh, very impressively see that early treatment can really uh, decelerate the progression and um, be very helpful in treatment success. Uh, how long does it take to see uh, the, the benefits of treatment? Well, this depends obviously on the grade of tissue damage that already has occurred. So the stronger the complications are already, the longer it takes. So this may, might at least be a month um, and uh, therefore you should um, not do a judgment on treatment success before half a year or even one to up to two years of treatment. Uh, many of the tissues are bradytroph tissues, so they are not, uh, there is not a very uh, strong vasculature in these tissues. That's why the drug that comes by um, uh, with the blood uh, takes some time until you can see the improvement of treatment. And we have further questions. Are there Minimal number of the mentioned clinical presentations to diagnose the Hunter syndrome. Uh, well, um, to be honest, for someone that has experienced in diagnosis Hunter's patients, the facial features might be enough to recognize it. Or uh, also the claw hands, uh, so the contractures of the uh, digital articles, uh, they can be not 100% specific, but they can really guide your uh, diagnosis. Uh, so even one symptom can lead you to the right diagnosis if you see it. However, in most cases, before there is very strong clinical features that as uh, one symptom um, guide you to the right diagnosis, you can recognize patterns. So you should really try and find the uh, patterns for mucopolysaccharidosis to make the diagnosis early enough. For example, clinical features are hard to recognize in the first, um, uh, before uh, the second or third year. That's why many patients are diagnosed only at the fourth year, fifth year, when they really have strong uh, facial features. But it would be good to diagnose them earlier. And if you go back in medical history of these patients that are diagnosed by the facial features, then you, in practically 100% of cases, you find the pattern uh, like with hernia or hydrocephalus or uh, similar symptoms, you find it in the first year of life. So uh, you sh uh, it is really advisable to look for the patterns rather than for single symptoms. So one symptom can be enough, but if you can, if you are able to recognize patterns, you might uh, find the right diagnosis earlier. So we have another question. Um, is there a newborn screening and is it worth it? Well, uh, there is many programs that work on newborn screening for mucopolysaccharidosis. However, um, in practice, it's not that easy. The biochemical or even genetic Testing is not uh, the major hurdle, but um, there is some cases that uh, would only, um, w where you cannot be sure if it's a true case or if it's only an individual that carries a mutation or has a slight uh, derangement of um, enzyme function. And uh, in uh, newborn screening programs, it's obligatory that you uh, can separate the um, really severe cases that, that need the treatment from the very mild cases that could also be uh, treated either later or don't need treatment at all. Uh, that's very important to be able to separate uh, the very mild forms from the severe forms. And in practice, this is the hard challenge uh, in establishing newborn uh, screening programs. But I'm very positive that this last challenge in the newborn screening of mucopolysaccharidosis uh, can be overcome in the near future. Which professionals are involved in the less urgent symptoms of Hunter syndrome and how should these specialists interact 
with a multidisciplinary team to provide information. So um, the less urgent um, symptoms might, for example, be the facial um, dysmorphism. Uh, that, of course, uh, depends very much on the training of the person that is recognizing the features when it's done early or rather late. And um, so if uh, I think that's a, a common uh, procedure that if a pediatrician, for example, or family physician would recognize uh, some um, obvious uh, facial features that indicate a genetic disease that they would either contact a clinical geneticist or centers for rare diseases to uh, recommend further investigations. And um, I also experienced that in some cases the orthopedic symptoms However, they really impact the families and the development of the patients are taken as, as given or taken as minor uh, by the caretaking uh, medical specialists. So uh, this is another uh, strong um, advice and invitation for orthopedics. Uh, if uh, uh, there is unusual uh, orthopedic problems with joint stiffness, for example, or rigid spine, um, or um, pathological deformations of uh, the spine and uh, vertebrae and, and also uh, fingers, for example, that uh, with that findings, uh, clinical geneticists and or a center for rare diseases should be approached to help with further diagnostic steps. I'm very aware that MPS is not the only, only disease um, which comes along uh, with dysostosis, uh, but um, obviously uh, most of the cases that sh show uh, clinical features compar comparable to the strong dysostosis multiplex of MPS patients need further investigation, further diagnostics uh, in the setting of uh, clinical genetics or um, rare disease specialists. Do these patients have neuropsychiatrist symptoms and what characteristics and possible treatment? So uh, many of the Hunter's patients uh, develop CNS symptoms, so hydrocephalus, but also psych uh, neuropsychological symptoms. And as seen in our patient, Tom, uh, aggressiveness can be one of the first signs or um, lack of concentration can be uh, another sign. Uh, the loss of uh, milestones, de developmental milestones are com commonly observed in patients with CNS involvement. However, not all patients have CNS involvement. Uh, Hunter's patients can show normal intellectual development. Um, but obviously, as soon as you have the diagnose, uh, this function is uh, closely to be, to be monitored and to see uh, how these patients can uh, be helped. If, uh, um, like aggressiveness or um, attention deficit is observed, uh, it's not uh, um, trivial to uh, help with drug treatment, for example. There are several options to be done, but this is clearly uh, to be done in the hands of experts and uh, it's very difficult to understand what is a drug effect in these patients, for example, with Ritalin or any other um, uh, drugs that could be used from uh, effects of the disease. Sleeping problems all, uh, oftentimes um, come with the disease and it, this, this makes it even more difficult to see um, what is the cause of um, concentration, uh, concentration deficit, for example, because many patients uh, don't sleep very well. On the one hand, this uh, comes with uh, um, airway obstruction, nasal obstruction, airway obstruction, uh, which can lead to uh, um, uh, hypoxygenation and um, also there seems to be um, problems with a normal sleeping uh, rhythm. 
but clearly the drug treatment of these problems uh, should be done by experts. There is not much data available from clinical trials on that, so it uh, depends very much on the clinical experience, uh, experience of the respective expert. Let's see if there is uh, one further uh, burning question. Are any features in pregnant women to be anticipated that uh, her baby has Hunter's syndrome? Well, I am not aware, I'm not an um, obstetrician, but I am not aware of any clinical feature that uh, is regularly seen uh, in, in pregnant women. Of course, uh, with the um, option of or with the chances of uh, ultrasonography, uh, there might be features available that can be recognized, but um, I think in, normally this needs uh, even that there is a positive family history and the sonography uh, screening is done more explicitly or in, with, with uh, more often and, and with a closer look, so to say, uh, that something can be found. Uh, family history is key, even uh, if there is not um, a, a pregnancy going on at the moment. So, as it is a genetic disease, Hunter's disease uh, is X-linked. So, we should always do a proper uh, family history and um, a genetic, genetic history uh, when we see these patients to do a proper consulting of the family. And then we have another question. Should we look for hydrocephalus early in our patients without all facial features before second and third year of life? Well, I, I think that, um, like, uh, if I understand the question right, the question is, should we do a, a sonography screening um, in, in those patients or in, in all babies, so to say? And, um, as to my knowledge, there is some regions where sonography is quite common in the first uh, weeks of life, but I think the, the rareness of um, inborn uh, hydrocephalus, even in MPS uh, patients, uh, is, does not justify a general uh, sonography screening. However, uh, the measurement of head circumfer uh, circumference can be indicative as well, and this should be done in every contact with the newborn and, and uh, infants in general. The countries where I was trained and uh, where I work in, uh, this is a standard that we do a uh, head circumference in all newborns and infants, and I think uh, this can be done easily and is a good hint towards uh, hydrocephalus, uh, macrocephaly at least. And I think with that our time is over and I thank you for your interesting questions and I hope you found it interesting to learn a little bit about Hunter's disease and good luck with the early diagnosis of Hunter's disease patients. Goodbye.